Welcome to a thought-provoking episode of Municipal Affairs. I am your host, Chris Brown. And today, we're not just diving headfirst into a dialogue that's about politics, but it's about progress. We're shining a spotlight on a topic that has evolved over the years, but yet still carries its weight in relevance and importance. Women in municipal politics. In 1918, a trail was blazed when Hannah Gale, a courageous but determined soul, etched her name in the Canadian lexicon of history by becoming the first woman in Canada to be elected to a municipal council, serving as an alderman in the city of Calgary. One year later, Violet Barce was elected to Delia Town Council alongside two other councillors. Now, in January of 1920, Barce was elected by her council as Reeve of that small Alberta community. Later that same year, Constance E. Hamilton added to the ongoing movement as she took her seat on Toronto City Council, igniting a spark of change that would transcend generations. But it wasn't until 1936 when the tides of transformation truly began to start surging. In the small northern town of Webwood, Ontario, Barbara Hanley took the reins as mayor, defeating incumbent Mayor Robert E. Strike by only 13 votes, showcasing the profound impact that women leaders could have in shaping their communities. Yet as we stand here in 2023, it is evident that there's still a path to tread. According to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, women while making remarkable strides still comprise less than half of elected members on municipal councils. A journey that began with a single step in the early 20th century continues to unfold before us today. So... I am thrilled to welcome four exceptional leaders who are not only making their mark, but are dedicated to accelerating that pace of change. Joining us for this dynamic roundtable discussion are Vancouver City Councilor Rebecca Bly, Torbay Councilor Trina Appleby, Niagara Region Regional Councilor Diane Hewson, and Strathcona County Councilor Katie Berghofer. Our focus for this episode is crystal clear. It's about breaking the glass ceiling, shattering stereotypes, and inspiring more women to take their rightful place in the halls of municipal governance. So fasten your seatbelts and prepare for a riveting exchange of ideas, experiences, and aspirations. We embark on a journey towards a future where our municipal governments are not only diverse and representative, but are a testament to the untapped potential that lies within our communities. Stay with us. Because the conversation starts now. Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I want to take a moment and I want to thank each and every one of you councillors for sitting down and participating in this roundtable discussion. Before we get into the actual roundtable part of this discussion, I want to take a moment and let each and every single one of you introduce yourself, because I want to make sure that the people who are only listening to this via audio can get an understanding what your voices sound like before we get into the actual inter the roundtable discussion. So on the screen, in the order that you are appearing for me, we're going to start with Councillor Appleby from Torbay, Newfoundland. Can you introduce yourself and just talk about how you got involved in municipal politics? Hi, Chris. Uh, thank you. Good to see you again. Nice to be back on your show. And thank you for bringing together this pan-Canadian panel to have a conversation about women in politics. I think it's a very important discussion. Uh, as you know, I'm Trina Appleby. I'm a councillor in the beautiful town of Torbay, which you'll see behind me on the screen here. Very proud to be here with my friends and colleagues. Very excited to share with you that these are all friends that I met through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And uh, I am a single mom with two children and three dogs here uh, having this uh, session this evening at my home. So uh, if I mute, uh, I just tested it, <laughs> it's because it might be needed. But you know what, if we're talking about the realities of women in politics, uh, let's be real about what it is. So uh, that's it for me. Very proud to be a council member in the town of Torbay and uh, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trina. Regional Councillor Diane, Diana Houston, and now over to yourself from the uh, beautiful Niagara region in Ontario. Yes, happy to be here. Thank you for the invite. I'm thrilled to join such distinguished colleagues as the ladies you have in front of you. 
Um, as, as you mentioned, my name is uh, Regional Councillor Diana Houston. I'm directly elected to the region of Niagara from the small town of Pelham. And uh, re the Niagara region has about um, 12 municipalities plus the regional government, about 500,000 people. Um, we're known for our tourism, for our wine sector, for our manufacturing. Um, it's... I. And, and one of the things that I that drove me to kind of get into politics is when I was growing up, my aunt was in politics. So I kind of grew up around politics and we had a very uh, acrimonious uh, term of regional council, probably the 2014, 2018 term. Um, I was standing by watching, uh, I think the region get its name dragged through the, the mud due to a lot of scandals. And I thought, you know what? I can do better than that. <laughs> So I thought I had the audacity to put my name on the ballot and couldn't believe after I put my name on the ballot that uh, uh, there had never been a female candidate in Pelham for the regional councillor position. So it was even that more exciting when I got elected for the first time and I got reelected in 2018. And I've been talking about uh, the importance of women participating in politics and trying to support my colleagues not just um, in our region, but where I can across this beautiful country. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here and thrilled to be a part of the discussion today. Thank you, Regional Councillor. Now over to Strathcona County with Councillor Katie Berghofer. Councillor, over to you. Thank you. A again, I'm Councillor Katie Berghofer from Strathcona County in Alberta. Uh, we're in Treaty 6 and we also sit and represent or we sit on the lands of Métis Nation of Alberta, Regions 2 and 4 in my area. Um, myself, I was elected in 2017 was my first term. I'm now in my second term in Strathcona County. What led me along this path, again, a little bit with family history, I, I would say my father was an assistant deputy minister uh, in the Alberta provincial government. My parents were both immigrants. I'm first generation Canadian and they fully absorbed themselves in all uh, walks of life and all levels of government and participating. My older sister even has a master's degree in political science. I myself did not, but I was very active as young in, in, in volunteering as a child through my teens and then in my current community in uh, Strathcona County where it just became evident that, again, I could see things a little bit differently, but what really brought it home, it wasn't my intent in 2017 to even put my name on a ballot, but after five, six, seven different people, and sometimes more than once saying, this is an opportunity, you should make that step and represent your compute, uh, community, that's a decision that I then reflected on and uh, talked with my family about it as well to see if it's the right step because it was a big step for us to to endeavor on this and that's what brought me here today and like I said I went for a re-election and I'm I'm still here. Thank you so much counselor and then to truly make this a, a Canadian wide show we head over to Vancouver with counselor Rebecca Bly. Counselor over to you. Thanks very much, Chris, and to my colleagues. I'm very happy to be here um, with this esteemed group of uh, electeds that I have the pleasure of calling colleagues at FCM, but across the country, we work on issues every day that matter to the residents in the communities we live in. Um, such such important work. So um, yes, my name is Rebecca Bly, um, and I am joining you from the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam the Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh. Um, and uh, I've been elected, this is my second term. So I ran for council in 2018. Um, and, I, you know, I had a bit of an unconventional start. I was a single mom at 21. And um, without sort of having the traditional formal post-secondary education until I later went back to school in my late 30s, um, really felt that representation matters um, around council chambers, and I could bring a perspective of um, of um, a working mom uh, in a metropolitan city that is trying to make ends meet, that needs daycare, that needs work opportunities, that needs transit, that needs all of those things, and of course that scope and that focus has expanded now in, in fifth year of being elected and a second term um, to be understanding some of the critical social issues that were challenged within our city um, and, and housing and infrastructure and just the important role that um, local government plays because the decisions we make 
affect people's daily lives almost immediately. And so it's an incredibly important um, role and a true honor to be serving the city in this capacity. So bringing a couple of decades of that work experience um, to the council chambers. Thank you so much, Councillor. So I guess we need to start with the big question. Now, in my discussions with municipal councillors from across Canada, uh, particularly women councillors, I often hear the phrase, you have to ask her to potentially get involved in municipal politics. Now, I've had the pleasure to sit down with Councillor Appleby and uh, the, the, it's how she got involved when a former uh, municipal politician asked her. Uh, Katie, you just said the exact same thing, that five or six people came to you and asked you about getting involved. What is it about the act of actually asking women to get involved in elected office that is so powerful? Because you don't often hear that from male counterparts saying that they need to ask men to get involved. Why is it so important to ask women to get involved in municipal politics? Who wants to take that one? And I apologize. I, I know this is not the question I originally opposed, but I think it's the one that I need to start off with to ask the next question. Who wants to answer that question? Anyone? Well, I, I mean, I don't mind jumping in really quick because um, I, I didn't know that both Trina and Katie were asked. I too was asked. So I guess I'll just add my name to the by a um, person who had run previously municipally and actually not been elected and um, and was also a friend of mine. And um, yes, I, he was he asked me and it was because I was just out there doing the things I do fundraising community, you know, creating events, people being maybe like having a certain degree of influence, you go take your kids through school and daycare, you build relationships, you don't burn bridges. These are very good things for people in politics, um, particularly in local government. So I think there was, and I, you know, I think it's important to ask because you're right. I think women are less likely to sort of have a um, I'm going to put myself in that seat. I don't, and maybe we'll talk more about why that is on this particular podcast and it's something yep. we need to get underneath. Um, um, so yes, I can say I, I too was asked at a, at the right time, um, that, that had me think about it, but it wasn't why I did it. I, I, it sort of opened a door and then I went and like Katie described, you know, really followed through the process and, and considered it for two years before actually choosing to run. So um, it was more about a door was open, but it was still up to me whether or not I was going to step through it. Diana, at any time, had anyone asked you about potentially running or was this always a career path that you had wanted to join? Because you talked about in your opening statement that there had been no regional councillor that was female on your council prior to your election. So was it someone asking you or was it you just wanting to represent uh women on your council in that position so I didn't get asked <laughs> I feel like I'm you know like it's like the prom I didn't get asked the prom no um I didn't get asked but I did have a friend um a friend who was she was going to a women in politics session and it was a um kind of a, it was like a, a open to the community women who are maybe interested in thinking about running and I'd always been interested in politics and informed about politics I wouldn't say more so at the municipal level but I'd been paying attention to politics I went to this session and they we talked a lot about um, why women don't put their name forward or what are the perceived barriers or or dispelling I guess some of the unknowns around campaigning and what what you need to know in order to thinking about running and I think attending that session um, really kind of opened up the, the potential like like this was potentially something I could do and it, it helped dispel some of maybe um, what I perceived as barriers as not being um, so difficult to overcome so I was asked to the meeting but not necessarily asked to run and then uh, my colleagues might find this funny when I did announce to my my friend group I was running for the regional position. Um, one of them actually, one of my friends actually said, "Oh well, why don't you start at the town level?" <laughs> and I said, "Well, 
the issues at the town and the policies developed at the town are completely different than the um, issues that are, are dealt with at the regional level. You could think of it in terms of a micro versus a macro policy perspective. And those are the things that I'm interested in. So she's kind of taking herself now and it's like, I don't even know why I said that to you, but um, it, you know, it was um, one of the best things I, I feel like I've ever done. Um, and I've certainly brought a voice there um, that, hasn't had a strong presence, I would say, probably in, in a long time. So uh, I'm glad that I put my name forward and uh, I, I've used my voice to try and encourage other women to think about this as a potential uh, profession for them as well. Sorry, I, ha I have to clarify something. And I wanna know from everyone else on the panel as well, when people did ask you, did they ask you to put your name for it municipally or did they say another level of government first off? Because uh, Diana just mentioned that she went for regional, but her friend said town. So is when it comes to elected office, are people asking women to get involved municipally or are they asking them get involved elective office, maybe start at school board? Because traditionally that's a more woman centric and I, I and I apologize if this comes off like a very rude question. I think it's one that is needed because that is just an eye-opening statement that the regional councillor just made there. And I just want to make sure that this is not an experience that she just had, or maybe it is. And we need to just asking people to put their name forward, no matter what level of government it is. Who wants, Trina, Katie, do you have any statement on that? Sure, certainly. Uh, for myself, I mean, I can speak for myself. It was... Uh, during the time for a municipal. So again, I put my name forward, I believe it was in August of 2017 when the election was October, 2017. So people started asking me, uh, I believe in spring, possibly is when the conversation started and it was municipally. Uh, beyond that, I then continued on and was asked at different levels. Um, I did have the question asked of me when I was running and actually had my name for it and door knocking, why wasn't I starting as a school trustee? And my kids were, were in school at the time. They were seven and nine years old. So I definitely was very active. I was on parent council. So I'm fully involved in, in all of that part as well. But for myself, that wasn't where the interest was. I didn't see the issues that were impacting myself and my community wasn't at the school board level. It was at the municipal level. So that's why I then chose to run. And I would just explain that to people as well. But there was exactly what you said. People think it's a stepping stone for myself. This isn't a career position for me. It's just a, a part of the path and the journey that I'm on. Rebecca, what about yourself? Uh, you said that as people did ask you, did they ask you to go right for city councillor or did they say maybe you should start with PTA or school board or even I know in uh, in Vancouver, there's the parks and I think it's uh, the parks commission, if I'm not mistaken, you're probably going to correct me right now. But did they say you should run for city council right off the bat or were they asking you to run somewhere else? Well, it's a, yeah, and I, I, I appreciate you've picked up this this very important point. Um, I'd say from what um, Diana shared, I was asked to run. So first of all, I was asked. It was suggested I run for park board. And the if you follow municipal politics in Vancouver, you'll know that the the rationale was park board's fun. They just sort of you know judge on soap derbies. And the joke is, of course, park board is one of the most stressful positions in the city of Vancouver right now. And um, is nothing short of, well, nothing to do with soap derbies, that's for sure. All that to say, then the next was how was school board? So it was a little bit of, um, and then somebody who knew me very well said she's best on council because she, the breadth of experience um, is will be too limited under a different. So anyways, I but it definitely was a bit of a stepping stone as opposed to like opening that door and sort of rolling out the red carpet in terms of getting my street cred, if you will. Um, that being said, I was very new to politics. So I think there was like, let's warm up. And I think that's natural. Oftentimes municipal politicians then go on to provincial and then federal or, or some other level of government. So I didn't take it as a slight, but it definitely was not um, a paved path. Trina, what about yourself? I, I know that a uh, former councillor did, or former mayor, if I'm not mistaken, did ask you to I run. Know, 
did, did, are did, good staff. did they ask you to run just for council or did they say maybe you should start with school board because you are a single mom and you have two children in school and i'm not trying to be the sexist host here i just i think it's a fascinating story that diana opened up here and i just want to make sure i get everyone on the record here yeah, no, Chris, uh, what happened with me, I was asked initially in the town of Bjorn, where my dad served for almost 30 years on the council, and my grandfather, as you, I think I've mentioned in the last interview, served as deputy mayor as well. So I think there was kind of an expectation when I was first elected, um, one of the guys who did the training with us, he said, how old's your daughter? So I'll know when I need to do this again. So it's a little bit of an expectation, I think, in my family that I may have had an interest in this space. But it had nothing to do with that when uh, when Craig came to me and we uh, were involved in the community. At that time, I was involved with a time in Torbay committee. I had just taken over the soccer club and uh, I was a single mom going through a divorce and trying to figure out how to pick up pieces in my life. And um, uh, Craig is my neighbor. He lives three doors down and knew me quite well and came over and said, you know, Trina, I um, think you'd be really good at council. Would you consider that? And actually the deputy mayor, the current deputy mayor, um, she um, had asked me about six months prior, you know, at the school, if that counts, uh, we were there for something else. But she said, uh, you know, Trina, I think you'd be really great to run for council. And at that time, you know, back to the conversation with timing, the timing just wasn't right for me at that point. Uh, but when Craig had asked me about six months later, it was more of a consideration. And I thought about it and I spoke to my children and I did speak to my family. And, um, you know, I, I thought about it and I went, you know what, I think I'm going to give this a go. I'm going to run for council. And uh, Chris, I've never looked back and, I've, you know, I've always enjoyed every part of it. And I'm very happy to be a member of the town of Torbay Town Council. Absolutely. Now, you are four incredible councillors who have been all elected in their own right to represent the people that you represent. But there are key challenges that women face when even entering into the political arena right off the bat, whether that be sexism, whether that be a genderism, whether that be uh, stereotypes that it's a male dominated field compared to a women uh, field. Um, what challenges do you see in 2023, facing more women getting involved, like yourself, and representing their communities on council. I want to start with, uh, 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 sorry, my, my mind's blanking right now, Katie, on this question. Wonderful, because, um, and thank you for the question. When you when you put in the notation about 2023, it, it really brought forward a very current issue because myself back in 2017, there was different impacts and different issues, but 2023 has brought forward social media and social media is, is definitely a huge barrier. I mean, it, it, I think it does impact men as well, but uh, some of us and, and including my myself at some points, social media is um, an opportunity for people to be behind um, not being face to face and use hate and bias to target you and go after you. And, and a lot of everybody is able or uh, to cope with things like that. So we do face that. I, I think it's not just limited to women. It does go across the board, but it's how social media is used specifically against women in politics and in leadership roles. So it's not limited just to us, but leadership roles across our country where social media is the unique thing that would be different for myself significantly from 2017 when I first ran and currently. Rebecca, do you, you have something to add there? I thought you just raised your hand there. I might've been wrong there. I would know me probably just fidgeting. Oh, okay, but I, I want to follow up on that with you, Rebecca, because you are from the largest city on this panel, Vancouver. Um, so you probably see this more often than not with the rise of online social media uh, negatively impacting counselors. And I say counselors as a whole because uh, Katie is right because it just doesn't affect women, but it affects men as well. But predominantly more hate and online harassment is aimed towards women, in my opinion. Please correct me if I'm wrong. How do we change that? And I know that's asking the million dollar question. How do you change a, a society to not see online hate? But how do you tell prospective counselors or prospective candidates to become counsel to deal with the online rise of social media and the negativity that comes along with it with women in politics? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, there's a few different uh, angles to answer that question. And, and there are more and more solutions coming out, tech-based solutions to help filter out, um, particularly on platforms like Twitter or those that you really do get those sort of keyboard warriors that are anonymous and anonymous images and um, the vitriol that comes from that anonym anonymity is incredibly harming, damaging. Uh, I, I had my my um, home doxxed on Twitter after voting on the supportive housing development. So, you know, these things are um, incredibly, and what I noticed after that happened is I actually just took a real step back from online presence. And so in retrospect, it has impacted me in a significant way because I'm no longer willing to engage like I did before that happened. I have a family, you know, it's a big city, but it's a small community, if you know what I mean. So um, I think those things are happening. Um, I, there are organizations and, you know, I'll, I can share them later uh, with you directly, Chris, um, that are bringing out sort of um, uh, apps that can be layered on top of these um, so that you literally don't, you can mute, of course, followers, but you can also anything with diff, uh, selective words that are particularly violent or particularly harmful, you can direct the software to just delete that comment or to block that comment entirely. And I think that is necessary. Um, with COVID and being elected through that time, there was an incredible um, spike in online hate towards elected officials, uh, the frustration and the polarization around all the things related with the pandemic um, and the, the various sort of opinions about how that was dealt with seem to all be directed and made us uh, targets for a lot of online um, abuse. And then I think you're right. Women are targeted in a different way. I think there's a power differential. I think it's based on gender. And it's important for us to stand up to that. And it's also important that our counterparts of any gender stand up too. And so that this doesn't become a victim issue. It's really about everybody who sits in that seat has a responsibility to uphold a certain level of um, decorum, if you will, even online, so that it remains um, healthy and not damaging to somebody's mental health simply by being in the, the seat that they are. All that to, I've managed to be an elected official without being on Twitter all that much this year. It's it's man, it's doable. You know, this whole like you've got to be online to be successful as a politician. I don't know. I'd rather be out in the community shaking hands and meeting people and really engaging. So I just don't take as much time online anymore because it really is not serving that purpose, in my opinion, in my experience. A few years ago, we we saw the. I, I'll, I'm going to ask you this question here, Diana, if that's okay. Over the last few years, I, I've seen I've seen through media reports the horrendous things that women deal with on a regular basis who are put into the public light, whether that be from anonymous social media posts, whether that be through people like you said doxing someone's house, people going to their house. Um, in 2023, I couldn't imagine this happening, but here we are. Youth four have all openly said that you all are our good friends. How important is it to have support groups that you can talk and openly talk about issues that are facing not only counselors, women counselors, but counselors in general, that you can have open dialogue and have a support group that can just not give anything back but just listen to you is it important in 2023 to have this type of friendship that i'm seeing here with you for to make yourself successful in your careers diana and if you want to add on to the last thing that rebecca said happy to let you do that as well yeah no i absolutely i think that we need you know if we want to attract and retain women in politics then we need to celebrate their successes and um, I think, you know, one of the, the dangerous things about what happened over the pandemic and, you know, what a time to have your first mm -hmm. term is when you're, you're dealing with a global pandemic and all the, the um, strife that that caused. But um, I think the the idea that it was, you know, uh, protesting or attacking people's home is somehow fair game is just shocking to me. And I think that most of society thinks that there's something wrong with that. And yet, you know, there's there's 
people in our community who seem to think that that's okay. So I don't, I don't know how you change that because even um, uh, those, those people can also come to council. There's, you know, they're a member of the public, they have, they're entitled to be there. Uh, there's, isn't really a lot of, I think, pr protections other than if something, some type of violence took place, which is very concerning. So the idea that, um, you know, um, uh, harassment, intimidation seems to be fair game is, is uh, concerning to me. But aside from the negative aspect of politics, and I think what we don't talk about uh, enough is the positive side of politics. Because if you, I think if you asked all of us, are you happy that you got involved in politics or what are what are some of the positive aspects? I'm sure we could list a hundred different things uh, where, you know, something happened in our, in our community. We helped an individual. We helped a business. We made a policy move forward. We we're able to champion something with either our province or the federal government. There's there's those stories aren't really breaking through. And I think that's the point where you're going to attract women to politics is when you tell them that what they're able to accomplish and you and you say there's a there's a, a group of women who will support and champion you and celebrate your successes along the way and i think that that's what women need to hear okay then let's put that on the table right here right now we'll start with councillor appleby on this question what is the positive of women being elected in politics what advice would you give a prospective candidate who's putting their name forward in saskatchewan next year in alberta in two years in ontario in three years and the atlantic provinces in another year for some provinces what would you be telling women about the the benefits of getting involved because uh, councillor Houston's right there is an attraction and retention of counselors that needs to be addressed. And I think the attraction is the big thing that we want to address. So for you, how do you attract more women to politics? Thanks, Chris. That's a great question. And, you know, it, I just wanted to start with, you know, I'm looking around the screen here and I'm looking at friends and colleagues from coast to coast to coast. And the thing that has kept me in the political arena, this is my second term as an elected official, the thing that has kept me in this arena, without question, are the people in the arena who stand with you. And, you know, I have the great pleasure of serving my community, having my children watch their mom lead in this way. It's been brilliant, amazing. I can't tell you that I haven't experienced difficult situations. I have. Listen, it's understood, unfortunately, that that is part of the game. But my hope in being in this space is to have a space where we can lead, where we can ask for change. You know, Councillor Houston did a great job in, in her council by bringing forward, you know, things that were necessary to ask for a different and a safer space and a more respectful space. And, you know, we've done this work at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, building friendships and allyships. And, you know, Katie was my um, vice president for two years as I chaired the standing committee to increase women's participation across Canada. Rebecca is doing that as a member of the executive right now at, um, at FCM. We have an ability in this time with our energy and our expertise to make a difference in this sector, to help raise the bar, to use the tools that are available to us through our municipality, through our PTA, through our, uh, you know, our, our association with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to have these conversations in safe spaces to work together and use the privilege and the resources at our disposal to voice our concerns, to talk about the things that aren't working right, and to try to set a path for things to be better. And retention looks like building those supports, having those allies. You know, when, when Sinead O'Connor passed away, and I loved her music, I'll tell you right now, I loved her music like many others. And, and I saw what happened with Chris Christofferson when she was booed on stage. And if I could just for a minute digress to that, he was a, an ally who stood in his power when she wasn't at the height of her career, when she was standing up for something she believed in, and I won't get into her personal beliefs on this, but you know, we as women and all elected officials stand for what we believe in respectfully. And, and we need to have allies when the chips are down to stand in our corner and say, look, you might've made a mess. You might've done whatever you did but I'm gonna stand shoulder to shoulder with you and help you find your feet here. So recruitment is being asked 
retention is staying in the space and forms of harassment come in many different ways in this sector. And it's not just within the political realm. It happens in life. It happens in schools. It happens in workplaces. But I think what we need to do to attract and retain people is to have honest conversations about what's happening. What can we change? Can we have anti-heckling legislation? Can we work and have conversations about what we can do with our power and privilege right now to support each other? And the last comment I'll have on this is that you know, I was at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities AGM in Toronto this year, and it was amazing to be there as a board member. I have to tell you, it was absolutely delicious. But one of the things that I did while I was there was I went to my hotel room and took a phone call from a colleague who was in the sector, ready to hang it up, and had it, they were done. They're like, I've had, I just can't take any more of this. And we spent hours on the phone that weekend, and I spent a lot of time reminding that person why the public had the confidence to put them in that seat. And you know, it's those kinds of supports and friendships, I think that help people go, right, I can catch my breath again, I can assess my mental health and make that really sober decision of, do I wanna stay in this sector? Do I wanna continue this work? And I will say to you, Chris, my experience has been, and no matter what I've been through and what's happened since I've been elected, I'll tell you right now, it is still the best decision I have made in recent times. I love it. I love the fact that my kids get to see their mom lead in this way. And I love the ability to have that voice at my my council table. So those are my thoughts on uh, on that. Katie, what about yourself? What what role does uh, retaining women in a municipal, in any elected office, I should say, but particularly municipal with four municipal councillors around the table, in, what, what's the highlights that women in politics accomplishes? And what do you say to people who are looking to do what you did and get involved? Yeah, I was just reflecting on... on um... On the question as as the two friends that were presenting on it as well and really thinking for what are what is the right answer for me where where do i reflect on that and the first thing i thought about was the first motion i brought forward and it was about making my community safer myself like i said my kids were in grade or not grade sorry they were seven and nine years old and it was a school zone impact. So the provincial government in Alberta has these three different time zones. And it was very confusing for when a school zone speed limit was in place or not in place. That was one of the first motions I brought forward to council to get support, to make it clear, to make it safer throughout the entire school day to protect our children. So now, like on my way here into my office from my home, I drive through school, three school zones to get here. And I see that sign every time. And I know I made it safe, not just for my children when they're at school but for any future children in our community. So that's just one little example of an impact that I did early on that kind of drives me, what else can I do? What other impacts can I have? Then at the regional level, uh, regional and, and beyond, Trina mentioned it as well. So it's something unique, maybe not unique, I think it's blossoming across the country is something a former councillor, Bev Eslinger from the city of Edmonton. I, uh, I count her as one of my mentors, mentor even to joining FCM, but also as um, the lone female councillor in Strathcona County when I started. Prior to me, there were four women, but then I was myself by myself in 2017. She started a regional group of women uh, just in our area of municipally elected women to come together uh, sometimes it was once a year, twice a year, even during COVID, we were meeting like this on Zoom to still keep that going, where we came together over lunch or breakfast that had a guest, guest speaker sometime to discuss issues that were impacting us, but also to make those connections. So when we attend these conferences or, or meetings where we're out of town and maybe we can't have a spouse or friend come with us, that we have a connection there that makes it a safe environment for us as well. And also has a friend and someone to look to when you need those moments, like Trina mentioned, where she had a colleague phone her. It's really important to have those times. And, and even I remember in, in the washroom at one of my first conventions, meeting Kathy Her Heron, who's the mayor of St. Albert and having the connection with Kathy Heron now, and she's on the board at FCM as well. Now it's, it's those little things that you have that you need that keep you going and, and learning from these amazing women 
And I have to say there, there are some very amazing men. I, I, get, I have met many as well that really learning from their experiences and what they've also done across the country in their different municipalities that you can then bring home to yours and see if you can have impact here locally. That's what really drives me on because I see you know, Strathcona County is an unbelievable community to, to live in and represent. But I know we can do even more and do better. And that's what really drives me to keep going and build upon it. And, and hopefully more women that see us here doing this and coming forward will encourage them that, yes, they have the opportunity. They have the same voice that we have. They just need to show that voice. Rebecca, what about yourself? What, what, what What's the benefits of attracting and retaining more women in municipal politics? Does it change the atmosphere around city council? I know uh, there uh, you're, you've been around council for now in your second term. Have you seen the, the addition of more women around the council table as a, a positive in your experience? And when you talk to your fellow councillors across BC, across Canada, is there a net positive when you find more diverse uh, voices around the council table instead of, and I'm saying this as the uh, white white male here, but the straight white male just sitting around the council table informing, making decisions based on the diverse community that they represent. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that representation matters, as I mentioned in my intro, and that extends beyond gender, right? Um we, I live in probably one of the most multicultural cities in the country, and we still have a predominantly and have always had a predominantly white council, you know, in terms of um, the membership. We did just elect our first uh, Asian mayor, which is very, mm -hmm. you know, first Chinese mayor. It's a very exciting step forward, but still, um, I've had the fortune of being um, surrounded by amazing women on council since the day I was elected. So, when, in 2018, we elected eight out of 11 representatives were women. Um, and, and now I, I believe we're probably closer to parity um, in terms of five out of six or, or you know, five and six split. All that to say, um, you know, I think it's very important that younger generation of women see, but that happens in all sectors. I mean, you think about groups, uh, women in STEM, that, you know, um, when it comes to various professions, I think there has to be a certain level of attention, focus, energy put behind making sure that parity is not um, sort of overlooked as an objective for, like I say, in any sector. Um, and can I, can I can I challenge you on something here for a second, uh, Rebecca? Sure. I apologize, and I apologize. If I was gonna, I wasn't gonna ask this question, but you just mentioned the word, and I see it all the time. I hear it all the time. We don't need parity. We need the right people in the position. We don't need tokenism. And I hear that all the time. And that's just from social media. I'm not saying I surround myself with these people. My Jew gay husband will tell me that I that is not the case. But I want to know. You talk about parity as a good thing, but how do you combat against the idea that just because you're a woman, you deserve a spot on council? Just because you're a woman, you deserve to be there. Well, and you guys, some of you are shaking your head right now. There's some people who are out there who are listening to this going, I, I don't care if you're a woman or a male, I want the best person to represent my community. How do you hey, battle so back? Don't go so ahead. I, and I apologize for asking this question. I just, I, I need to know how I should, as an ally, you, you who should never that apologize should... for, you should never apologize for asking a question, Chris. That's the seat you're in. Um, <laughs> Tell that to my husband, very, please. This is, very, this is a very good question. <laughs> and I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to respond because we're talking about two different things. As an individual, you go out and you tell your story. You get elected based on your credit, like, no, I don't mean credentials like university. That's not my story in that way. But I mean, like, your authentic resume, your life experience, what you're bringing to the table, what solutions you have, what ideas you have is why you ought to be elected. What we're talking about is systemic. So it's different in the sense that this world was the 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 structures of which we govern in were created by men whether we like it or not we're going back hundreds of years and so the realities are if somebody didn't put their hand up a woman and say well hang on a second i'd like a vote 
at least, we wouldn't be anywhere near where we are today. So, you know, it's a very, not criticizing you, Chris, but to sort of oversimplify the argument to say that we believe we deserve a spot, I can tell you nobody sitting on this panel right now feels entitled to be in their seat. They've earned their spot and they continue to earn their spot. But I think that parity at a minimum ought to be a goal to push up against the systemic barriers that keep women in the minority in local government. So I that is just the reality uh, Vancouver, I think, is a bit of an anomaly and has been for some time. And even at FCM, where you've found all of us to be directors as a group, as colleagues, has changed tremendously since we created a committee increasing women's participation in local government. That didn't, we're all, we're still elected. We're still, that the, our numbers at FCM are still determined by what happens in local, in local elections. So it's not manufactured, it's not orchestrated. But by putting focus and attention there, we have naturally been able to write, write, rise up the voices of women in local government to have a fair shot, to have equitable uh, time. And that, is focus that we need to continue to push on. And I just want to say one other thing. And, uh, you know, I think about Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, who has recently stepped down and been very transparent and very vulnerable and vocal about her why. It's not a failure for women if they choose to not to run again. It's not a failure of women that say, I've had enough of the aggression or the abuse. That's not a failure. They were in their seat and they made the difference that they made and they'll go on to do other really amazing things. I think that um, we have to make choices and respect each other's choices as individuals based on what's best for each other. Um, so I just I just wanted to sort of say that as well. And at the same time, we have to support one another, but not like a support group where people feel like they have been victimized. We need to hold each other's voices up, raise each other's voices up as respectable elected, elected officials who have earned their spot at the table. And then also make sure that whatever needs to happen, everything has an action and we support each other in getting there and we hold each other accountable in getting there. Because this is not about a support group where we are complaining about something. This is about us changing you know, the world really um, as a collective. Diana, you wanted to jump in there? Yeah, I just, you know, I look at politics as a window of opportunity. And at some point that window closes, whether it's because you closed it or somebody closed it on you. So you really have this short period of time, I think, to really make your mark and make a difference in your community. But I wanted to address, you know, your questions around should women be entitled to be at the table? And it's not about entitlement. And I'll give you some numbers, uh, some Niagara numbers. 79.6% uh, of our single family are, are female led. Okay. 62.3% of our, our public transit ridership that rely on public transit as their primary mode of transportation are female. 79% of our widowed population are female. 65% of our 85 plus population are female. So if you think about we deliver public health, we deliver childcare, we deliver um, public transit, we deliver emergency services, we deliver senior services, all of these should be considering these this data because it's relevant data data that can inform decision making, um, so that we can lead to better service delivery. And that's not because um, women are entitled to be at the table. That's because women can speak to direct impact and experience with these services and programs um, that you know, other groups perhaps don't have the experience with. And when, you know, those those groups who are impacted the most by the services and the programs are absent from the conversation and the decision making, it means that uh, as a municipality, you risk uh, delivering services that are ineffective, uh, potentially um, uh, inefficient, and even worse, wasteful, wastes money. So in looking at it from that perspective, 
it's better to have decision making informed by groups who are actually directly impacted and represent uh, the services and programs that are uh, using the services the most. I want to talk about parity for a second. And in my introduction, which was pre recorded, the very first woman to be elected in Canada to a municipal council was in 1918, here in the city of Calgary. In 1919, a second female was elected, a second woman councillor was elected in Delia, Alberta. She would go on in 20, uh, 1920 to be uh, named Reeve of that community. Now, it wasn't until, I just want to make sure I get this right here, 1936, when the first mayor female mayor was elected in a Northern Ontario community of Webwood. We are still a long way from parity and parity is 50, 50. I need to ask all four of you and whoever wants to jump on this question first, go right ahead. Why is it in 2023, a hundred and almost five years from that first election where we saw a female on council, we have not yet reached parity. Who wants to answer that question? Who wants to answer the toughest question I probably will have posed in this entire interview? I, I'll jump in with the first thought. I think okay. it's everything we've talked about on this panel so far. It's, um, you know, as you say, you started out, did you need to be asked? There's an opportunity there. We talked about online vitriol and hate and abuse being directed particularly at women. So the issue is not getting women, well, the issue, the limitation is still women not getting elected, but what we have found, and we represent 96% of the Canadian population with FCM, a board um, membership of over 75 members, it's about keeping women elected. So do we get elected and then people say, oh good, we have a woman on council, we are not, you know, we, we've sort of checked a box. Or are we actually giving women an opportunity, equal opportunity to um, serve on various committees, chair different meetings, you know, actual leadership roles within their elected so that they can continue to, to strive. And, and I don't see that as much. I see a lot of, I do see women being elected and then men still largely hold court uh, in many ways. And it is about creating space. In, in further inviting in, in further inviting in. So um, to say why, that's a very, very complicated question, but my first initial thoughts are, are that is about how do we keep women considering this as a profession that they're willing to do um, for more than one term? Katie? Yeah, it, thank you. If I can just build upon that. Um, one of the things that in the provincial government here in Alberta back in 2017, they put forward uh, the ability for us as elected officials to have a paternity or a maternity leave. That wasn't in existence before. There were very strict rules with our municipal government act that instituted you couldn't take time off to go care for a child, whether it was given by birth or adopted, whatever it may be, that wasn't there. We did have different labor laws for us as elected officials. So the provincial government put that in to have the ability. I think it was either the city of uh, Calgary, Edmonton were first at added, and that was also a motion I brought forward that passed in 2019 here in Strathcona County. So that's a barrier. That's just one example of a barrier that impacts genders because Again, the female gender is the one that's able to actually give birth to a child, not just for paternity to raise a child, but we're the ones that give birth. So if we need to have that time to heal, to rest, and to care for our, our child, it wasn't in the legislation that that could be possible for, for an elected official. So now that is a possibility, but each municipality within the province of Alberta still has to put that in so they can have that permission. So the provincial government allowed it, but it wasn't until 2017. So again, almost 100 years after, as you mentioned, when the first elected officials are women was. And so, you know, it's it's a huge step forward to have that ability because, again, I'm still, still a mother. That's my role. I gave birth to my two children. It's still a role. I took my maternity and paternity leave at the time for both of my children, stepped away from my full-time employment, and I had that ability. That same ability isn't here for this type of job. 
So again, that's just one example of a barrier that we have that might be keeping more women away that they said, okay, at this time and place, this is when I'm going to step forward or, or come forward to be elected after these points have happened. So that's just one example as to why there is the setback that we're not even at 30%, let alone 50% parity in municipal elections. Yeah, and Green. can I? Yeah. Diana, go ahead. Uh, I, I had my daughter when I was 19, like young, and you know, I, I got into politics when I was, well, I think I was 42. <laughs> so, you know, I don't think this would have been an option for me if my daughter was young. And I was a single mother for a long time as well. Like it, it just, with all of the pressures of, or the, the, you know, the family commitments, it was, it was just, it wouldn't have been feasible for me to do that. And I do think that's a bar the barrier that women face. We do often take on more of the family responsibility. And that's true, whether it's children or elderly dependents. And it also applies to, um, to in-laws, uh, interesting enough. So um, that, the, the pay is another uh, issue. Uh, I don't know what my colleagues are like, but uh, my position is actually a part-time position. I work full time in addition to my original counselor job. And ironically, if, if this was, if I only did my regional counselor job, I wouldn't be able to afford to live in the community that I live in now. So I couldn't do this job um, if I was not, if I didn't have another job that provided me with it, another income. And the other thing is confidence, I think, um, holds women back. I think the saying is that, you know, men will apply for a job if they have 60% of the, the qualifications and women hold off until they find something with 100%. And um, I think, you know, we tend to hold ourselves back from seeing things as being possible or seeing ourselves capable of doing certain things. And uh, that's where, you know, we can maybe feel, feel a bit more comfortable with risk taking and, and you know, believing in our potential um, to see these positions as something that's viable in terms of a career. Trina, over to you, and then I have one last question for everyone, and then we'll wrap up here. Go ahead, Trina, if you have any dad. Oh, I do indeed, and thank you very much. You know, I grew up playing with Barbie dolls. I grew up being told you're going to grow up someday, and you're going to have a big wedding, and you're going to have a family, and this is what it's going to look like. And listen, I I was very lucky. The, the first female premier of my province was my dad's deputy mayor and has been a lifetime role model and friend to me. And, and I had the privilege of seeing and knowing that, you know, these things were, were possible, but there's a culture, there's a culture that expects women to carry the load. There's a culture that expects us to be the primary caregiver. I didn't think this was a, an option that was available to me either when my children were really young. Um, they were still young when I, when I was elected five years ago, but uh, you know, the family support that's needed, the ability right now to get my kids to hockey and basketball and still participate in budget deliberations. And now we have policies in place after COVID that say, well, you can only participate so often virtually, and you can't really participate and function properly virtually anymore um, because uh, you need to be in the space, but you can't divide yourself in two. So when we talk about inclusion, diversity, they're great buzzwords, but the actual practice of having that in the space is, a, is an issue. And I'd like to go back just to your comment about parity. You know, parity is a, is, a, is a term that we used when I first came at the, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. But in the last four or five years that I've been around the council table and three or four that I've been at the FCM table and MNL table in particular, the conversation has changed from women in politics to gender equity in politics. So if we're really gonna be real about what parity means in 2023, it doesn't mean just men and women. It means people who identify however they choose to, however they're comfortable and however they wanna live their honest, authentic lives, seeing and feeling and knowing there's a space for them at this table. We have all kinds of new Canadians in, in Canada. We need new Canadians in Canada. We need culture. We need diversity. I love it, love it, love it when my kids come home and talk about new friends they, they've met. I've got friends from different ethnicities from all around the world. And you know what? I value and adore them. And they face challenges in our communities that if they don't have someone to speak for them, if they don't have their voice brought forward, how are they going to be represented at our tables? So I think the conversation around parity is broader than just men and women anymore. All of the things that my friends have talked about as they've shared, I've been here going, 
nodding, yes, yes, great point. Oh, that's true too. But I gotta say, I think the other lens that I wanna bring to this conversation is parity has a different definition for me in 2023. And I think it's really important that we make sure that we include that in our go forward conversations about how do we get the right people around the table who have earned their seats as Councillor Bly stated, because she's very right in that. Every one of us had to put our names forward. We had to get the confidence of our community to put us in our seats. And that we've earned it, we have a right, we have a voice, and we have a privilege, and we need to continue to work in this space to make space, to hold each other up, to support each other, and to make sure that other people can see themselves in these seats, bringing their gifts forward to their community. So uh, th that's what I think about parity, Chris, and the work we need to do. And I've got to tell you, as I listen to my colleagues here this evening, I'm just so grateful to be in the company of these amazing people as they as they talk from coast to coast to coast about you know what it's like to be a woman a woman in this sector and all the good work that we're doing and all the good work that there is left to do thanks you you talk about diversity it seems like you've been looking at my uh screen because that is a upcoming episode uh, in the, in october so we'll be having another group of panelists on to talk about diversity and inclusion in municipal politics as i said i have one last question for everyone who's around this table and it's more of an advice what advice would you give prospective candidates? What advice would you give to your younger self that is about to enter into municipal politics that you wish you would have known or wish other municipal potential prospective candidates would know before entering into the political arena? Because until we achieve that parity, whether that be parity for diversity, gender, inclusiveness, uh, we need more people to actually put their hand up and put their name on the ballot like all four of you have done. So what advice would you give prospective candidates that you wish you would have known before entering in the political realm? And now I started with Trina to the opening of the show. So I'm going to go in reverse order this time. So Rebecca, yourself, what advice would you give prospective candidates or what advice would you give your younger self about entering into the political realm so you can break that glass ceiling that so many women try to break, but you four have, uh, have done it? Yeah, that is a very um, tough question to answer uh, in just a couple of minutes. You know, my advice would be to any young person who's considering um, is just to do it. Um, if you're thinking about it, then you should do it. Like, I don't know anyone I've met that's thought about it that then you know, it's like jumping in a cold ocean. It sounds like a really bad idea, but it always feels good after. Like, just if you're thinking about doing it, just do it. And you'll learn something about yourself when you do. And that will fold into what you take forward. Um, I would say, and, and maybe that is how I tackled it myself. Um, what did you learn about in? yourself? Well, just to trust myself. And... Um, to know that the learning curve is steep. There's no way you can study what you need to know to be in this seat. Uh, it's not what you're gonna learn in a political science degree. You have to get, you have to jump in with two feet and you just have to do the work and be willing to ask a lot of good questions and a lot of bad questions. There's no such thing as a bad question. And um, yeah, just do it. If you're thinking about it, it means that that's probably the right choice for you. And so, um, and then I think the only other thing I would say is, is find mentors and find people that you um, look up to and you respect and engage them. And I, and, 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 con and continue to connect with them and, and have build those relationships because they're, they're needed when you're in this type of uh, field. And um, I bet that the benefit will be both ways. Um, so, yeah. Katie, what about yourself? What advice would you give a prospective candidate who comes to you and says, is this right for me? For me, I, I was just thinking about something I even just told my daughter yesterday. So my daughter, she's an elite a hockey player, just moved up in age, divi age division here in Alberta. And it was first tryout was yesterday. 
So I, I asked her beforehand, I'm like, what's fueling your fire? What's going to get you to get those doubts um, away from you so you can be put your best foot forward? Because uh, it was actually her first game back since she broke her hand in March playing hockey. So it was very first game. She had a lot of doubts. So I asked her, what fuels your fire? What's putting you here and putting you forward? And that's what she reflected on. So it's the same thing when you're going forward, in, whether it's municipal, if it's school board, if it's regional, whatever the issue is, what's fueling your fire and then build upon that. So if if you have that need met, if you have that you know little voice in your head saying you could do something better and bring it forward, do it, see what it is and build upon it. Um, again, the motivation, motivate yourself. I had to do a lot of that, especially getting myself to go to that first door to ring that first doorbell. That was hard. And I remember playing music, just pumping myself up to get out there and just do it. I'm like, what's the worst going to happen? They slam the door on me. Oh, well, then I'll just go to the next door. So for myself, again, let's see what's fueling your fire and just build upon it and just go for it. If you want it, go after it. So what's your fire? What's your fire that's fueling you, counselor? Oh, right now? There's just so much more potential. You know, there's there's many things I want to see through and continue to build upon. Uh, I see things, you know, in our budget queue the next four or five years. I need to get those done, right? I'm sure there's going to be more that are going to add on there, but there's many things that can make Strathcona County even greater than it is. And that's what a vision I have and I want to continue to work towards. Regional Councillor Houston, what about yourself? What what advice would you give your younger self who's about to enter yeah. politics or a prospective councillor candidate who comes to you and says, is this right for me? I'm writing down notes. I think I've got a, a couple of things. Politics is about timing. It has to be the right moment, not just for you, but for, the, for your constituents. They have to be ready for change. Do the work. It's going to lead to, a, a, I think, a good outcome, whether whether you get in or not. It's an experience that you're going to learn a ton uh, from. Um, make the most of the moment. Again, speaking to that idea of you have a window in front of you and uh, anything that pushes you beyond uh, your comfort zone um, leads to growth. So. I don't so know. What's, I guess what's, what's been oh. your biggest push? What's been your comfort zone that you got pushed out of being an elected office? You know, you know what was really hard for me? Just just uh, putting my hand up and starting to speak in the meeting. I really had to push myself to do that. And but I really felt that um, I felt like I had a responsibility to to have my voice heard because I was cognizant that I was one of a minority of a group that traditionally hadn't had a strong voice in decision making. So. And, and, you know, since that time, I, I developed a women's advisory committee at the region. We've done motions on uh, gender-based violence. We've called for um, a recall mechanism for counselors who, you know, commit egregious acts. We called on the provincial government to support the uh, $10 a day uh, child care program. Like, there's been so many things uh, that I... I think are just amazing positive and well-received things and it's because you know I lifted my hand I took I took the moment to do the work to put the motion together I put myself out there and probably nine times out of ten I got support so it's been good thank you and to end off the entire show Councillor Appleby from Torbay <laughs> Newfoundland Labrador what advice would you give prospective candidates or even your younger self about entering into politics uh, thank you, Chris. Um, I think that, you know, my, the words that came to mind when you asked the question was, we need you. We need people. We need people who have an interest and a love and a passion for the community to find their way to give back to their community. And whoever that may be, you know, it can be volunteering in many different ways. For me, it's sitting at my municipal council. And, you know, I think building your friendships, finding those spaces and opportunities where you can make a difference and really take on something and do the work to, to try to make that difference. And if it's changing your community or raising the bar in the sector or, you know, pushing forward for equality, we, we have privilege. We have the ability in this seat to do amazing things. And I can tell you, uh, when I was first asked to run in this seat, when I thought about it, you know, and I, I thought about it over the years, maybe I'd run someday. I never dreamt in a million years that I would run 
and be elected the very first time I ran as the deputy mayor of my town. I never dreamt in a million years that a year in that I would run for a seat at the PTA and become the Avalon Director of Municipalities in Flynn, Labrador. And then I never dreamt that I was ever going to run again and get the seat of the Vice President of Newfoundland and Labrador Municipalities in our PTA, our Provincial Territorial Association. And then I put my name on the ballot for the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And I had three great years serving as a board member at, you know, in that space, two years chairing a national committee. And the pride of being able to use my time to influence and make change in those spaces, spectacular. And now I'm back at the FCM table as a non-board committee member, still participating in a different way. But, you know, being able to sit at that table, bring my voice, bring, bring my community's perspective forward. And I have to tell you, if I didn't put my name on the ballot, I never would have had the opportunity to look at my children before I went to the FCM conference and AGM in, in Toronto and say to my children before I went, guess what mom's going to do? And the kids are like, oh, what do you mean? You're going to Toronto without us. We're not impressed with this. And I said, hold on, this one's special. And they said, why? And I said, because mom was invited to sit at the table and have a conversation with the prime minister of Canada. Chris, I never dreamt in a million years when my name was on that ballot for the first time in the town of Torbay, even the second time in the town of Torbay, that that would have been an opportunity provided to me. But I got to tell you, the look on my children's face when they saw the selfie of mom and the prime minister sitting around that table, that was pretty cool. So, you know, if I if I had the ability to tell someone or my younger self, it would be say yes. The opportunities that have been provided to me since I put my name in that ballot, the work that I've been able to do, the amazing things that have happened have all far outweighed any of the negatives that have happened. We have a great, amazing, amazing sector that there's space for everybody in. If you see yourself in there and you want to put your name on a ballot and you want to try, we're here to support others. We're here to lift you up. We're here to work together. We're here to make a better community, province, and country. That's what we're doing. And I got to tell you, I'm proud to have the opportunity to do it. So that's what I would tell myself or anyone else that's interested. If you're interested and you want to know what it's like to serve in your community, if you're entertaining in any way, put your name on a ballot, reach out to one of us. We're here to work with you. We're here to help you in any way we can. Yeah. Oh. I want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you to each and every single one of you who are around this uh, panel right now. Um, I have a passion for municipal politics. If you don't follow me on my show, you probably know that I talk to a lot of municipal politicians from coast to coast to coast. And I think in honesty, Municipal politicians are often the forgotten politicians. They are the ones who, as Scott Pierce would say, the president of FCM, you are the government of proximity. You are the front lines. You are the people who serve our communities and make them better. And I don't think you get this word thrown at you a lot, but I'm going to say it right here. Thank you. Thank you for serving your community. Thank you for being at that table. Thank you for making this com our country better. Thank you for making our communities better. And more importantly, just as these panelists have said, go out and ask someone, go ask women to get involved. It is important in 2023 to have more diverse representation around our councils in rural areas, in urban centers, in small local communities. It's important to have diversity. So thank you so much, all four of you, for sitting down, taking the last hour and 15 minutes. I know I said an hour, but we ran a little bit over time. I hope that's okay with everyone. Thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor to host you all four. I look forward to seeing you all at the FCM conference here in Calgary, Alberta next year. And maybe for the three of you who have not appeared on the crossboard interviews, get ready for a little e email invite in your mailbox to appear on the other show. So thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Pleasure, Chris. For having us. Thank you. Thank you so much to our guests for joining us on today's episode of Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown. To our viewers, thank you for tuning in and for being part of this conversation. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest content. From this show, the Municipal Affairs, to the cross-border interviews and even the political trenches, the local government at work, we have you covered for all things municipal. Now, if you're able to, please consider backing the show to help us to continue to grow 
and produce high quality content. Every little bit helps and we appreciate your support. A link to our support page on the Cross Border Interviews website is in the show notes. So once again, thank you again for tuning in. And remember, until next time, just keep talking. Thank you.